Thanks. Hello, my name is Mark Herson, professor at Northwestern University. It's a pleasure to be here today to give you a brief summary of the talk that I gave at Hetero Nanocarb. The title of that talk was Interfacial Engineering of Two-Dimensional Nanoelectronic Heterostructures. And in this talk, I explore the role of interfaces, which are ubiquitous in two-dimensional materials. These interfaces include interactions with the substrate, interactions with the surrounding environment, also includes internal interfaces such as grain boundaries and defects such as vacancies, all of which can play a significant role in the properties of two-dimensional materials. Ultimately, what uh, I attempted to do in my talk was to explore how we attempt to understand and control these defects to realize positive phenomena such as new types of devices. The first material that I explored is molybdenum disulfide. This is a relatively wide band gap semiconductor. In our lab, we grow this via chemical vapor deposition, which allows us to control the stoichiometry of molydisulfide, specifically looking at substoichiometric MOS2, which has a high concentration of sulfur vacancies, which act as n-type dopants and therefore control the electronic properties of molydisulfide. Our molydisulfide is also polycrystalline, which implies that it has a high concentration of grain boundaries. And recent theoretical reports have suggested a strong interplay between vacancies and grain boundaries, which lower the barrier to motion of vacancies in polycrystalline MOS2, something which we're attempting to exploit for new types of device phenomena. Specifically, if you take our material, you wire it up with two contacts, and you apply large lateral electric fields you see strong changes in the charge transport from high to low resistance states, which appears to be mediated by vacancy motion, which controls charge injection into the molydisulfide. This behavior is indicative of a memristor, and memristors are interesting devices for non-volatile memory, but because we're doing this in atomically thin molydisulfide, that implies that we can also gate the device with a third electrode and therefore, we get a device which is a hybrid between a memristor and a transistor. Uh, we've called it a mem transistor. And that device has potential implications for neuromorphic or brain-like computing, ultimately enabled by the defect structure of the underlying material. The second system that I explored in my talk is black phosphorus. Uh, this material has strong interfacial interactions with the environment. In this case, water and oxygen from the environment can react strongly with black phosphorus, ultimately degrading it irreversibly and catastrophically into phosphorus oxoacids. This is something which has to be controlled if we're ever to use this material in a real world setting. I would do this in a couple of ways. One is by encapsulating the material with atomic layer deposited alumina. The other scheme is to use a covalent organic add layer to passivate the material. The latter scheme is a much a lower profile method and one which enables you to use the black phosphorus in contexts such as sensing. The other way to look at black phosphorus is instead of fighting its chemical reactivity to exploit it. And the way that we do that is to use conductive atomic force microscopy to locally etch black phosphorus. The electronic properties depend upon thickness, and as a result, local etching allows us to create heterostructures within one material just by controlling the thickness locally. The final material that I explored in my talk is a two-dimensional phase of boron called borophene. A borophene is different than the other two-dimensional materials in that there's no layered version of boron in the bulk, and therefore we can only realize it by growing it directly, which we do in ultra-high vacuum by evaporating boron onto single crystal silver. As a new phase of matter, we explored in the talk the atomic structure of borophene. It turns out that there's two different phases that are possible depending upon the growth conditions. And using atomically resolved scanning tunneling microscopy and synchrotron x-ray scattering, we're able to, to, to deduce the detailed atomic structure of those two phases. The good news practically is that both phases have the same electronic properties, they're metallic, and therefore it's not 
so critical for practical purposes to control the growth precisely. And that therefore enables us to look at possible uses of borophene. Specifically, we looked at it as a contacting material to other two-dimensional materials, specifically an organic add layer called PTCDA, which is an organic semiconductor. And using scanning tunneling spectroscopy, we could observe that the hetero interface between those two materials was extremely abrupt electronically. So with that, I want to thank you again for taking the time uh, to view this a brief overview of my presentation. Thank you very much.